he heard that the Buddha said to the king he should talk about his meetings with the other teachers. And um, now he gives an account of what has happened when he met with the other teachers. So he says, one time I approached Puranya Kasapa, exchanged greetings and courtesies with him and sat down to one side. I then asked him if he could point out any fruit of refugeship visible here and now. Now this is the king's concern. He wants to know what you're going to get out of this if you try doing this spiritual practice, what you get out. So when I had finished speaking, Purana Kasapa said to me, Great King, if one acts or induces others to act, mutilates or induces others to mutilate, tortures or induces others to torture, inflicts sorrow or induces others to inflict sorrow, oppresses or induces others to oppress, intimidates or induces others to intimidate. If one destroys life, takes what is not given, breaks into houses, plunders wealth, commits burglary, ambushes highways, commits adultery, speaks falsehood, one does no evil. If with a razor-edged disc one were to reduce all the living beings on this earth to a single heap and pile of flesh, by doing so, there would be no evil or outcome of evil. If one were to go along the south bank of the Ganges, killing and inducing others to kill, there would be no evil or, uh, or outcome of evil. If one were to go along the north bank of the Ganges, giving gifts, inducing others to give gifts, making offerings, inducing others to make offerings, by doing so, there would be no merit or outcome of merit. By giving self-control, restraint, and truthful speech, there is no merit or outcome of merit. Thus, Venerable Sir, when I asked Purana Kasata about the visible fruit of recluseship, he explained to me his doctrine of the inefficacy of action. Venerable Sir, just as if one asked about a mango, and would speak about a breadfruit, or as if one asked about a breadfruit and would speak about a mango, in the same way when I asked Purana Kasapa about the visible fruit of recluseship, he explained to me his doctrine of the inefficacy of action. And then, Venerable Sir, I thought to myself, one like myself should not think of troubling a recluse or Brahmin living in his realm. So I neither rejoiced in the statement of Purana Kasapa, nor did I reject it. But though I neither rejoiced in it nor rejected it, I still felt dissatisfied, yet did not utter a word of dissatisfaction. Without accepting his doctrine, without embracing it, I got up from my seat and left. Now, it sounds as if this was a totally out of the ordinary, but it isn't at all. What is being said here is the um, belief that there is no, there are no results. In other words, the actual fact that most people do not consider causes and their effects. Now here it is being explained as a doctrine that this man, this Purana Kasapa, is not believing in cause and effect. But as a matter of fact, in our society today, most people never even think of cause and effect. Something horrible happens to them and then they wonder, why is that happening to me? I'm such a nice person, basically. And uh, they can't see that it's actually been caused by themselves and we often wonder why people who we think are very nice and kind people have unfortunate things happen to them 
and wonder about that. This is exactly what this teacher believes in. He believes in the fact that there is no result from causes. Now, the king does exactly that, what often students do. They listen to what is being said, they're not satisfied, but they can't see that it's totally wrong. They have no understanding that it's totally wrong. They just they don't feel totally satisfied with it, but they don't know why. And very often that dissatisfaction that arises because of the teaching not giving them what they're looking for is also considered to be a personal matter. So here the king is having exactly that same problem that happens um, quite often, namely that the teaching is not satisfying and yet one can't put one's finger on why, because one doesn't know enough. Now obviously this king doesn't know enough, he doesn't know enough about karma to be aware of the fact that he's teaching a totally wrong doctrine. Five of these teachers are to teaching a wrong doctrine about karma. This one here is in particularly, particularly concerned with the fact that it doesn't matter what one does. Now that is also akin to our idea, let's make merry, we only live once. It doesn't matter doesn't matter what one does. Might as well enjoy ourselves now, no matter what it is. That is not, not an unusual uh, idea. It may not be taught as a spiritual discipline, although I have my doubts about that too. I have heard such things as a spiritual discipline. doesn't matter what you do. In fact, I've heard one, quite a famous one, and if I understood that correctly, which may not be the case, but what I understood it to say was that one should do anything one wants to do. Out of greed or hate, it didn't matter, because eventually one would get tired of that and would let it go. The Buddha said that's utter and complete nonsense that if one did not refrain from doing evil uh, or out of greed or out of hate, that the mind would get more and more used to it and become habituated in that evil direction. So it's um, again also something that was prevalent in his day because he spoke against it. And I have heard that in our day, also that kind of teaching. One should do whatever it is that comes to mind, eventually one would get tired of it and won't let it go. It's just the opposite. One wants more of it, one doesn't get tired of it. So this first teacher, he's very famous, this uh, first one, Purana Kasapa, his name is mentioned quite a number of times. He must have had a lot of followers, uh, thinks and says that it doesn't matter what one does, nothing has any effect. It's totally immaterial. He doesn't give any very good reasons for it. Um, why that is so, he just says so. But he also doesn't answer the king's question. He has no intention of answering the king's question, particularly probably because he doesn't know what to say, one would imagine. And Purana also said that if one thinks I'm doing evil, the doing of evil is a mere idea. There is no such thing as evil. It's just an idea in the mind. And I've heard similar things being said too. In fact, I read an article in a Buddhist magazine more than a year ago, it might be even two years ago. And in it, it was advocated 
that one should change one's relationships quite frequently because otherwise one would have attachment and attachment is against the Buddha's teaching. I read that myself. So one can turn, what I'm trying to say with that is, one can turn the best teaching around and make an absurdity out of it. One is really dependent upon one's own wisdom and intelligence. There are so many ways to turn the teaching around and make it come out wrong that they are far more numerous than making it come out right. So one needs to be careful about one's own ideas. Obviously, Purana Kasapa has his own ideas, and he propounds them as, um, as the truth, that, that they are his, his ideas. What he is um, concerned with is, is considered to be ethical, the negation of ethics, that there, is, there are no ethics. So with that, we don't have a spiritual path because the foundation of any spiritual path has to be ethics, moral con conduct, virtues. So then he goes to the second, then he tells about going to the second teacher. Another time I approached Makali Gosala and then again he says, I asked him if he could point out the fruit of recluseship visible here and now. And Makali Gosala said, Great King, there is no cause or condition for the defilement of beings. Beings are defiled without any cause or condition. There is no cause or condition for the purification of beings. They are purified without cause or condition. There is no self-determination, no determination by others, no personal determination, no power, no energy, no personal strength, no personal fortitude. All sentient beings, all living beings, all creatures are helpless, powerless, devoid of energy, undergoing transformation by destiny, circumstance and nature. They experience pleasure and pain in the six classes of men. Actually, what he is on about is that it's all predetermined fate. And this is one of the most common ideas prevalent today. When people say, oh, it's just my karma, that's why it's happening, that's exactly what they're saying. They believe that it's fate, it's predetermined, predestined, and that they have nothing to do with it. And when one thinks and says like that, one closes the door to change. One closes the door to self-growth and closes the door to what is called here self-determination. In other words, one is completely at the mercy of circumstance. And this is what this Makali Gosana um, brings out. He says there is no personal determination, no power, no energy, no strength, no personal fortitude. So, if that were the case, then the whole of this existence would be a very badly arranged lottery. And somebody is in charge of this lottery and is arranging it very poorly. Some people seem to win and others are com constantly at the losing end and some are quite doing quite well, so it doesn't, it makes um, a mockery of an intelligent human being. And yet, this is a well-known uh, teacher. He goes on to say, there are 1,400,000 principal modes of origin for living beings, 6,600 others, 
500 kinds of comer and 62 pathways and he goes on and on he says there are so many things and then he goes to say the foolish and the wise having roamed and wandered through samsara through the realm of birth and death will alike make an end to suffering now this is very common today people believe in evolution people believe in the fact that everybody is going to become enlightened eventually. In fact, I can see from your eyes that some of you do. No way. No way. It's hard work. There's no such thing as automatic evolution. Everybody's got to do it themselves. Now, very com you see now the wording of these things is a bit strange. It sounds as if this man is, you know, out of his mind is talking about all these uh, unbelievable ideas. But actually, actually, he's saying exactly what people are saying today. There is no such thing as an automatic liberation. The liberation which we can achieve is done through our own efforts at purification. So if there were an automatic liberation, we could cancel this meditation course immediately. What are we here for? What for? It's automatic. It's evolution. We're going to get there anyway. So why try? And this is what this kind of thing, of course, creates in people's minds. Just do anything. What does it matter? It's all going to come to an end anyway. Liberation is the end of suffering, he, he says that. He says, though one might think by this moral discipline or observance or holy life, I will ripen unripened karma and eliminate ripened karma whenever it comes up. That cannot be, for pleasure and pain are measured out. It's all predetermined. Samsara's limits are fixed and they can neither be shortened nor extended. There's no advancing forward and no falling back. Just as, and here now he gives a simile how he sees it. It's a personal opinion, of course. Just as when a ball of string is thrown, it rolls along, unwinding, until it comes to its end. In the same way, the foolish and the wise roam and wander for the fixed length of time after which they make an end to suffering. So that this teaches idea and um, it's pr primarily predestination and also this evolution idea and it also is that he maintains that the whole world is transformed in various ways without causes or conditions in other words he takes impermanence to be a fact but he negates causes and conditions so since everything is constantly changing spontaneously solely by its own intrinsic nature like the sharpness of stones the roundness of wood apples and the different shapes of animals and birds in other words this, this teacher teaches that because everything is ch changing all the time, there is no re need for any cause for, for the change, that because it is changing, we will all come to the end of suffering. He uses the truth of impermanence to make an untruth of it, out of it. It's very prevalent. And the Buddhist teaching also in this day and age is constantly used for that to use the truth of it to make an untruth out of it it's um, very often done because it appears easier well this is certainly easier if we're all going to be liberated anyway so we might as well just do what we like He says, everything is due to destiny, circumstance, and nature. Whatever will be, will be. Whatever will not be, will not be. These are his statements. 
So everything is due to destiny, it's all predestined, it's all fate, circumstances, and nature, the natural things that are there anyway. So there's no opening there for growth or self-improvement, self-determination. That's all left out. Now, obviously, it doesn't sound bad. I mean, it sounds quite reasonable what he's saying there. But the king says, when I asked Makali Gosala about the visible fruit of recluse, he explained to me his doctrine of purification through wandering in samsara, automatic purification through being, being reborn. And so again he says it's like asking somebody about a mango and he explains about a breadfruit and vice versa. And again he says one like myself should not think of troubling a recluse or Brahmin living in his realm. So I didn't rejoice nor did I reject. I was dissatisfied. And I got up from my seat and left. So then he went to see Ajita Kesa Kambala. They're not as famous. The next ones are not quite as famous. Then comes the famous one again. The first two are very famous. Purana Kasapa and Makali Gosala are often mentioned. This one not so much. Ajita Kesa Kambala. So he asked him, what are the fruit? And he says, Great king, there's no giving, no offering, no, lip, no generosity, no fruit or result of good and bad action, no present world, no world beyond, no mother, no father, no beings who have taken rebirth. In the world there are no recluses and Brahmin, Brahmins of right attainment and right practice who explain this world and the world beyond on the basis of their own direct knowledge and realization. A person is composed of the four primary elements. I see that's the truth. A person is composed of the four primary elements. So now he's making an untruth out of it. When he dies, the earth in his body <coughs> returns to and merges with the external body of earth. Water in his body returns to and merges with the external body of water. Fire in his body returns to and merges with the external body of fire. The air in his body returns to and merges with the external body of air. His sense faculties pass over into space. Four men carry the corpse. His eulogies are sounded until they reach the charnel ground. His bones turn pigeon-colored. His meritorious offerings end in ashes. The practice of giving is a doctrine of fools. Those who declare that there is an afterlife speak only false, empty prattle. With the breaking up of the body, the foolish and the wise alike are annihilated and utterly perish. They do not exist after death. So he preaches annihilation theory. And although it's quite true that this body is made up of the four elements, he uses that in order to prove his idea that there is nothing that's left of a person, that there is no real need to do anything good, there's nothing coming from bad because there's only these elements. So he's using a truth to teach an untruth again. And when he says there is no result, there is no world, there is no mother, no father, what he's also using is the teaching of anatta, of the non-self, and making, an, making a mockery out of it. So they all have some truth in their teaching, and because the king isn't wise enough to realize where they're going wrong, he just listens to it and doesn't say anything and gets up and leaves, but he doesn't feel satisfied primarily because he hasn't got an answer to his question. He got an entirely different answer. So then again, he says it's about like a mango being explained like a breadfruit. He only explained to me his doctrine of annihilation. And again, he says, I wasn't accepting it, nor was I embracing it. I just left. Another thing that these teachers are doing, and that's also very common in this day and age, it's rationalizing. They're rationalizing, they have a mental construction, how it should look. I mean, we all do that. We all have mental constructions, what things are. And with those mental constructions, we actually believe that. We're constantly believing our own mental constructions. If we were to stop doing that, 
we would get out of our own mental prison. We are imprisoned in our own mental constructions, like a construction site. With the construction site, you've got debris and you've got a building part, and it's all like a prison because you can't get out of it. That's all you know is that construction site. Once we let go of that, we can see much more and there will be eventually freedom. So these are teachers that are using their rational thinking in order to explain a doctrine which they have made up themselves. But it sounds logical, it sounds rational, and it could, I mean, if it was um, just seen on face value, one might not even notice what absurd teachings they are. And therefore, they go along with that. What this also points out, and is supposed to point out, how we are in, enslaved by our views. We are totally enslaved by our own views. Some of them are so absurd that one can hardly believe it. And some of them are so detrimental to one's own happiness, and we know it, and still we can't get out of those views. And this is another, just like an example of that how the one's own mental construction is making things difficult. Whether these teachers were unhappy or not, it doesn't say. What this last teacher does, he only refers to the physical part of us. And therefore he says that all the mental part also turns to ashes. Well, when you just hear it, superficially or read it, sounds okay. Everything turns to ashes. We've all heard that before. But when you think about it a little more, then it's uh, certainly not something that's conducive to a spiritual life. He says, fools prescribe giving, not the wise. Fools give, the wise take. So he turns it all upside down. And yet he had a lot of followers. I mean, it's okay, isn't it, to take instead of giving. So, um, I would say that in our society, everywhere in the world, everybody knows the opposite, but how many are doing it? So, it isn't as absurd as it sounds. So we have now three doctrines which have been expounded to the king. The first one denies karma, denies that there are causes. The second one denies resultants. And they, all of them, are concerned with the um, with fate, um, with um, predestined actions, and are all denying that there's anything that one can do. The Buddha says, a person with discernment, desirous of spiritual growth, should keep far away from such harmful people as one would avoid a venomous snake. So, then we have the next one. He's called Pakuda Kachayana. He's also not famous. So then he, the king goes and asks him. And this one says, There are seven bodies that are unmade, unfashioned, uncreated, without a creator, barren, stable, as a mountain peak, standing firm like a pillar. They do not alter, change, obstruct, they are incapable of causing pleasure or pain. What are the seven? Body of earth, water, fire, air, this is the four primary elements, pleasure, pain, and soul. Pleasure, pain, and the soul. Among these there is no killer, nor one who causes killing, no hearer, nor one who causes hearing, no cognizer, nor one who causes cognition. If someone were to cut off another person's head with a sharp sword, 
he would not be taking the other's life. The sword merely passes through the space between the seven bodies. Now that is making a mockery out of the Anatta doctrine. Obviously it's quite true that there isn't a person. There's only phenomena. But that doesn't allow someone to kill a living being. But he makes a mockery out of it by saying, well, there isn't anybody, so you can as well kill him. It's also, I've read that in modern books also, not as far as killing goes, but that there, since there is nobody, how can you make good or bad karma? So again, he says, I've asked this uh, teacher about the visible fruit, but he doesn't tell me anything. So I neither rejoiced nor rejected. I felt dissatisfied. And without embracing his doctrine, I went up, got up and left. And then he went to ask Niganta Nataputta. Niganta Nataputta was the founder of the Jains, which is, they're still in existence today. It's the only sect amongst all these teachers which are still existing, other than the Buddhas. And Nata Putta, Putta means son, it's just that he's the son of Nata. His name was Niganta, he's also called Mahavira. They, he was, a, of course, a contemporary of the Buddha. He established the Jains earlier than the Buddha established his um, Sangha. So he says, I asked him the same question, this Niganta Nata Putta. And this Niganta Nata Putta said to me, a knotless one is restrained with a fourfold restraint. Uh, they call themselves knotless ones because they cut their hair off and shaved also parts of it off. How so? A Niganta is restrained with regard to all water. He's endowed with the avoidance of evil. He's cleansed by the avoidance of evil. He suffused with the avoidance of evil. Great king, when a Niganta is restrained with this fourfold restraint, he is called a knotless one who is self-perfected, self-controlled and self-established. So this chap, and that's why this is the only one of all these sects that are still in existence, at least has the idea that there has to be avoidance of evil. He's the only one that has the moral ethics in mind. And the idea they had was that self-controlled it's a great with regard to their senses and um, self-established in a mind which is con uh, concentrated and uh, it uh, is in accordance with the teaching because it is avoidance of all evil. They had an idea about water. The um, doing something with water. Um, they do not use cold water ever, and that's still the same today. As an interesting aspect of it, that they one of their. Um, rules is that when they walk outside they wear a little mask over their mouth so that little insects wouldn't fly in and they also go out with a little broom in their hand so that they brush the ground in front of their feet so they won't step on little insects or animals that are on the ground um, in order to be um, cleansed of evil but the Buddha uh, explained that evil is only evil when there's intention behind it. If we by intention kill, then of course we've done evil. But if we have swallowed some insect or something and it is killed in that way, then that is an accident. And the same with our walking. We walk around and undoubtedly kill very much and very often but not because we want to kill but only because we have this gross body which does that sort of thing and we are killing all the um, bacteria in our body on because we, we couldn't live with them so 
all of that is going on all the time. And the Buddha said that that was not making bad karma. Whereas the, the Jains, the Nigantas they're called in that time, um, are saying that because there are many sentient beings living in cold water, one shouldn't use it. So in uh, many places in monasteries and in nunneries, we have little strainers in front of taps so that the animals are not going to come through. But if they fall into the strainer, then they're also going to have it very difficult to stay alive. So it is a very difficult thing to do this. But they don't want to, they don't use cold water at all. Um, presumably, they look for water that doesn't have any any sentient beings in it. And if it's a uh, water which has some sort of, it, I would say fresh water. They don't use fresh water. That's what I would assume it to be. It says cold water, but I assume it's fresh water. And I have seen them walk around in India with a little broom in their hands and a little mask over their mouth. That can be seen that they do that. And they're usually dressed in white. And some of them don't even go out during the day. Only go out at night. Uh, don't, sorry, don't go out at night because then they can't see if there's anything there that they could step on. So only go out during the day. So they take it to an extreme. And this is the teaching of him. So at least he's uh, interested in that people do, do no evil. And uh, so self-perfected is a a mind which has attained our control and um, self-controlled and self-established. So he's talking about the um, aspects of letting go of all impurities. But the king says, yeah, but I asked him about the, the fruits of the recluseship and he's telling me only the fourfold restraint. And the fourfold restraint is how to work at it, how to work at the at the morality, but he doesn't tell me what the fruits are, so I, again, I wasn't satisfied. So then he went to see the last one. And the last one is quite funny. He went to see Sanyaya Belataputta. Sanyaya Belataputta is a little bit famous because he was known to be a cribbler. There were many cribblers about, but he was sort of like the famous for that. So he says, I went to him and then I asked him the same question and then Sanyaya Belataputta said, if you ask me, is there a world beyond? And if I thought that there is a world beyond, I would declare to you, there is a world beyond. But I do not say it is this way, nor it is that way, nor it is otherwise. I do not say it's not so, nor do I say it's not so. Not not so, sorry, to not, not not so. Then you might ask me, is there no world beyond? Is it that there both is and is not a world beyond? Is it that there neither is nor is not a world beyond? Are there beings who take rebirth? Are there no beings that take rebirth? Is it that there both are and are not beings who take rebirth? Is it that there neither are nor are not beings who have taken rebirth? Is there fruit and result of good and bad action? Is there no fruit and result of good and bad action? Is it that there both are and are not fruit and result of good and bad action? Is it that there neither are nor are not fruit and result of good and bad action? Does the Tathagata, that's the Buddha, the Tathagata exist after death? Does the Tathagata not exist after death? Does the Tathagata both exist and not exist after death? Does the Tathagata neither exist nor not exist after death? If I thought that it was so, I would declare to you it is so. But do I not say it is this way, nor it is that way, nor it is otherwise? I do not say it's not so, nor do I say it's not not so. <laughs> he's, a, he's a pun. He's a perfect quibbler and uh, a, a person who does not want to commit himself on anything. Huh? It's called the Doctrine of Endless Equivocation. <laughs> it has a name. And it is, appears in the commentary to the Brahma Jala Sutta, to the 
Sutta on 62 kinds of views. So again, of course, uh, the king says, well, you know, he didn't tell me anything. In fact, he, uh, he brought out things I didn't even, didn't even want to know at all. So, um, so I neither rejoiced in it nor rejected it, but I felt dissatisfied. And with that dissatisfaction, I got up from my seat and left. Well, I think it is important to have a little bit of an idea what the Buddha actually said about karma. Because if the, all, all of them, the first and anyway, are concerned with karma, and then the next one, Niganta Nataputta, he's concerned with avoidance of evil, he's concerned with the moral conduct. Now, that's fine as far as it goes, and it is also the first thing that is mentioned then in the Sutta, moral conduct, but it doesn't go any further. So Niganta Nataputta talks about moral conduct, the avoidance of evil, cleansed by the avoidance of evil, suffused with the avoidance of evil, but he calls that already self-perfected, self-controlled and self-established, whereas the Buddha's teaching, of course, goes much further. And then, of course, this Sanyaya Belataputta is not to be taken seriously. So we can forget about him. But the first um, four are really concerned with with karma. So the Buddhist words about karma which is considered to be right view, the one very first step on the noble eightfold path is Karma, O monks, I declare, is intention. So intention in being in the mind, we have to watch our mind. And when we watch our mind and see what the intention is, we get a much clearer view of what causes we are putting into the stream. Because the causes that we are actually making happen are that exactly the effects that we're going to get. Now it happens in many people's lives that they get the effects and have no idea why. They haven't paid any attention to their intention. Their motivation is totally unclear. <clears throat> a meditator becomes clearer and clearer in the mind so that he or she can discern the motivations. Now, if our motivations are strictly self-cherishing, selfish, egocentric, where we're only interested in our own comfort, we're only interested in our own advancement at the expense of others maybe where we do not have that idea of giving and being there for other people our results are going to be disastrous and we won't even know why if we haven't really seen it what we have been doing we'll be very surprised now, karma is often mistaken to mean the things we bring with us from past lives. It is that too, naturally. But it is primarily what we do every day. We make choices from morning to night. And that's our intentions. And that's the karma we make. Now, the Life consists usually of small happenings. There are only a few peak moments, very distinctive, good or bad happenings in our lives. Mostly it's small things. And these small things are causing a lot of aggravation to us. Or they could be causing a lot of joy too. We have made them happen all by ourselves. We are the owners of our karma. We are heirs to our karma. 
It means that also in our daily lives that whatever happens we do not blame another. We don't need to blame ourselves either. But what we do is we take full responsibility for every bit that's going on in our lives. Without exception. Not just when it pleases us. Whatever happens to us is exactly what we have made happen. Whether we know it or not has no influence on that. Sometimes we may be able to see the connection. Sometimes we may be able to understand that a certain thought, speech and action has resulted in whatever result we get but many times we won't be able to we still have to accept the fact that it's ours that we are the ones that have caused it only then when we have taken that step having taken full responsibility to everything that's happening in our lives only then can we start to take control of our lives by remembering to make good karma. Now making good karma has an immediate result. We don't have to wait for anything in the future. We don't have to wait to see whether any of these teachers are right or not. Making good karma brings immediate happiness. It's It doesn't have any even time element in between. It happens automatically because we feel contented. Particularly if we are generous and we're giving, if we're loving and we give our love, if we're helpful and we give our help, if we forget about ourselves, When we forget about ourselves, there's nobody there to have a problem. So immediately it flows. Nothing that can hurt us in any way. Often people try to attain this state of forgetting themselves through distraction. Distracting their minds with any kind of sense contact. It works for a little while. It's usually very fragmentary the way it works. But to keep on forgetting oneself through the understanding of the illusion or in the beginning through the giving away of oneself has a much more solid effect. Making good karma prevents having remorse. Making good karma gives us a good conscience, helps us to feel at ease, helps us to meditate properly because we don't have enough anything that worries the mind. And it gives us a foundation of reliability where we can feel solid about ourselves. There's a story in the Buddha's time in the Vinaya about a monk who had been a monk for 25 years. And then one day he realized that although he'd been trying to meditate For 25 years, don't let that discourage you, (laughs) he'd never become concentrated yet and hadn't really attained to any super mundane state. So he became very depressed and he thought, it's useless for me to be alive. I'm going to take my life. So he got himself a rope and he climbed up on a tree 
and he tied uh, the rope around the branch and then tied the rope around his neck and he was just about to jump off when he remembered that in all these 25 years of being a monk he had never broken any of the precepts and there his heart became joyful the depression vanished he was full of joy and happiness so he took the rope off again climbed down from the tree and continued to practice and the story says that in the at the end of life he became enlightened so that kind of certainty about oneself of having done the best one can possibly do having had the best intention over and over again one intention doesn't do we make dozens of choices every day over and over that creates a feeling of being happy with oneself and that feeling of contentment with oneself is necessary in order to meditate properly and when one meditates properly one becomes even more contented so it all works in a cycle the less we are self-concerned the easier it is to make good karma the less self-concerned we are the less the self has a hold on us the easier it is we can become concentrated the self, the ego, is the one that's in the way it always raises its ugly head and says hey, but don't forget about me, I'm still here and should one be on the edge of con- concentration it comes back and says, no, no, no I'm still around don't forget about me the more one has already practiced letting go of self-concern the easier it works in meditation too the more it works in meditation the easier it is to practice in daily life there's no way the self can ever be made completely happy the self always has new ideas having got one thing it will get and wants to get another but one can be completely happy if there's no self that wants to be happy so the more we are able to let go of the idea of self-satisfying and the more we can have the idea of giving out what we have to share the easier it is to see that this is a truth we have to try it out making good karma is considered to be right view and right view is the first step on the Noble Eightfold Path it's also the last step when we get completely right view but in the beginning we need to have that view that we are the ones that are responsible for whatever happens in our lives nobody else it's not due to any other person's ideas emotions behavior actions it's only due to ourselves and when we get that quite clear then we have a good start for self determination and we're going to do something about ourselves that's also considered right view to do something about ourselves if we look upon each day of our lives as a whole of our lives then we can see that we bring with us to the next day to the next life the karma we have made in this one here we make karma 
in this one day and that those resultants go with us to the next day. If we've been angry and upset, we will probably have the same feelings the next day. If we've been loving and kind, we'll have the same feelings the next day. In the same way, it is from past life to this life. Falling asleep at night is a small death. The same thing. Only we don't know we don't remember. Well, we don't remember what we, the good or bad karma we made three days ago, do we? So why should we remember what we did last life? That's even longer ago. We just have very bad memories. And they become better when there's more enlightenment in the mind, become better with more mindfulness. But there's no need to remember all these things. The main thing is to remember what to do now. That's the only thing that really matters. Karma is totally impersonal. It's not crime and punishment. It's totally impersonal. It's cause and effect. So the one who's made the karma and the one who gets the resultant, the Buddha said, to say that they are the same people is one wrong view. To say that they are totally different people is another wrong view. The answer lies in the middle. So what we have is somebody who is making the karma and then we have somebody who is getting the resultant. Now if we make karma today and have the resultant tomorrow or one minute later, a change has taken place. It's no longer the same person. But that it's a totally different person is also not true because there is a certain continuity. So only when we have realized the illusion of self can we see the truth of that completely and then it doesn't matter anymore because then we won't make any more karma. We only make karma as long as we think we're somebody doing something. As soon as we no longer have that illusion, then no karma is being made. An enlightened one acts out of compassion, that's all, and out of wisdom. Complete compassion and complete wisdom. And acting out of that, without any person behind it, without a personal idea behind it, makes no karma. In the dependent origination, the first steps are ignorance, ignoring the Four Noble Truths, ignoring the illusion, and because of that, karma making. And karma making is usually depicted as a potter who makes pots, some of them very beautiful, very nice, well shaped, and others broken. Every potter has that. Um, unfortunate uh, results. Some pots come out nicely and some are broken. This is our good and bad karma that we're making. But only because we're ignoring the absolute truth. The absolute truth that the idea of me is just an idea. And that's all it is. The idea has, uh, however, been so firmly established in our minds that we're feeling it because thinking is also a sense contact and all sense contacts have feeling as a next step. I've already explained to you the four parts of mind, sense contact, feeling, perception, and then mental formation. And since the sense contact can also be thinking, that also creates feeling. So we have thought long enough to be me, so we now feel to be me. which is the human condition. That's the way it is. And as long as this is the case, we're making karma. And because we're making karma, we've got to be careful that we make good karma. And this is the danger inherent in human life, that we're constantly on the edge 
of making bed karma, even if it's only minor. It doesn't have to be major. It doesn't have to be a killing or robbing or anything as major as that. But minor bad karma already creates disturbance in the mind. And disturbance in the mind prevents meditation. And when meditation, calm, is prevented, then insight is prevented also. And this danger exists quite truly for everyone who is not fully enlightened. And therefore, we have to know that danger and watch out for it and watch our mind so that the in negativities in the mind are not allowed to be there and when they have already arisen, not allowed to stay there. The mind is the one that creates the karma. We then manifest it through speech and action, but the creation is in the mind. We are all the creators of our own living space of our own inner being we are creating something constantly and so we have to watch out what we create we are fashioned in the likeness of the creator we are the creator we're doing it constantly nobody's doing it for us we're always thinking it's due to somebody Somebody said something, did something, didn't do something, didn't say something. What absurdity. We are creating it all ourselves. And with that, we have to be mighty careful. Because what we are creating, that's the reality we live in, until we've created a new one. So the reality we live in is exactly what we have made it to be. That's karma making, every second of the day, over and over again. So the care we take with that, how much care we take, how precise we are with knowing the goodness and avoiding the badness, that is the results we will get. So the Buddha's teaching, obviously, is totally different from what these fellows are saying, but we can also see that the only one who has survived until this day, in a very minor fashion, Jains are not extremely um, numerous, is the one who at least had moral conduct and avoidance of evil in it. All the others have long been forgotten. That what brings an upliftment of one's spirit, the kind of elevation of consciousness, that is what the human mind is looking for. And the avoidance of evil and the doing of good does just that. So it is also the moral eth ethics are involved here, but there will be more about that in the Sutta but it's primarily the cause and effect here which is being uh, referred to. Okay. Any questions? There's no karma after the after a person becomes enlightened. Does it mean cause and effect? Is that always correct? Karma can only be created through the idea that I'm creating it. And if there's no such feeling of I'm creating it, there's no more karma. Besides, an arahant fully enlightened is completely purified. So whatever happens, it's all purified. And although the cause is there of purity, the effect is there of purity, and the effect of purity no longer has any effect on that body and mind, because there's nobody there to have an effect upon. So karma is also described kind of like a mental perception, it's like 
you keep making mental values and mental images and the idea of karma is too much. Karma is our motivations, our intentions, and it's all made in the mind, but then acted upon through speech and action. But the whole thing is first created in the mind. That's why I say we are the creators. But you see, um, I only threw that in as an extra about the Arahant non making karma. Uh, it's not pertinent. Anyone who's an Arahant isn't going to sit here, so let's assume they're not, you know. So it's not pertinent. So we really have to deal with the fact that we are making karma all the time. And that we will get the resultants of that. That's more pertinent to us. Something what karma really is, is, a, is sort of the, the result, the end result, of, or another way of saying, um, be careful what you do because. First of all, be careful what you think. Because then you do after you think. Yes. But First, be careful what you think. And that is much more difficult. Because if we are acting, actually acting upon it, uh, we have already had sort of a pause in between where we could maybe reconsider. But be careful what you think. That's why I hung up that little uh, verse out there on the door. That's right. It depends what seeds you sow. If you want to seed, if you want weeds, then you must sow seeds that are weeds. Otherwise, you must put seeds in that are flowers. It's be careful what you think because we are constantly in danger of making bad karma. Every negative thought is bad karma. It's mild, mild bad karma, but it's still bad karma. And we can feel that in ourselves almost immediately because we don't feel good after it. So we have a resultant. The resultant of karma is called vipaka, actually. But in this, uh, in our language, it has come to uh, both have to become called karma. But karma is uh, the cause, and vipaka is the resultant. So if we have a negative thought, immediately there's something not feeling so good in there. So if we really want to create something that is like a garden to live in like a, a beautiful environment for our own being, then we have to think it. Thinking makes it so. I have a question about how it is created during the meditation process. Right. I've noticed in myself that um, I'll have anger arise or rage, and I look at that and um, there'll be a result of my looking at that. There'll be some transformation or insight. Um, however, I notice there's a tendency or has been a tendency in me to suppress angry feelings. And so therefore I never look at them. And that's kind of, I think, a misconception of the process of harm and purification. Because it's necessary, it seems to me, from my Everything that is in my evolution to come forward so that it can be examined. So what about the thought or the feeling of anger or hatred that comes forth in the meditation process? Your description sounds very much like what is being taught in Western therapy at the moment, which is not according to the Buddha's teaching. It's neither suppression nor expression. It's recognition, no blame, change. All you need to do with anger and rage is to recognize that it's there. Not to blame yourself for it, not to blame another, either is the same, and change it. Substitute. So, so actually so the feeling coming out and experiencing the feeling and so through that experience you're recognizing and then allowing that to transform is exactly what you're talking about. 
I don't think you can allow it to transform. I think you're going to have to determine it to transform. Right. I think you're going to have to do something with it. Right. In, in, the in daily life, yeah. just as much, all the time. Mm -hmm. Whatever arises which is of that nature, which is negative, which is hurtful for yourself or others, you recognize that it is there. If you didn't recognize it, you wouldn't want to change it. Mm -hmm. So you recognize it. And as you recognize it, you have no blame. And then you substitute. In the same way as we substitute any thought that we have with attention on the breath in the meditation, we also do this in daily life. Anything that's unwholesome gets substituted with the wholesome. This is the same action. It is a skill which needs to be learned and practiced and it becomes habitual after a while. It becomes very simple and very easy. Now, if anger should arise in the meditation, it is easier to substitute because you can substitute with attention on the breath, you can substitute with loving kindness, you can substitute with equanimity, you can substitute with attention on sensations. You have many possibilities. In daily life, it needs to be continued like that with a substitution. Yes. When you talk about the substitution of sensation, um, substitution of sensation, did I? With sensation, with substitution with the sensation, yes. Um, if the emotion is powerful, it has a lot of sensation, a lot of it is the sensation part of it. If the emotion is powerful, it has a lot of sensation with it. Yes. Right? If the emotion is negative, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay, and it has unpleasant sensation with yeah, it. it has unpleasant okay. Well, the thing to do is to try and substitute with a with a positive emotion. That's what the whole learning process is. Is it? Um, does it work well to just focus on the sensation without the Sense of just as sensation and let it without knowing the emotion? No. Um, just without identifying with the emotion, just feeling it. Oh well if you cannot identify with your emotion, that's a big step. That'd be wonderful. Um, but in order to substitute any emotion you have to first know it. Yeah. So if you know an emotion of hate or anger, just as uh, Patricia was saying and you know that, and you have uh, heat or some other sensation with that, then it's a time to recognize that this is not beneficial for you, right? So you have the best thing to do in meditation is to substitute with attention on the breath. I mean, that's the best thing to do, because then you don't even have to do anything very uh, elaborate. You just get off it and go back to the breath. That's the, that's the easy thing in meditation. In daily life you have more work to do. In daily life you have far more to do because the emotion, unfortunately, most people think that the emotion is, well, it has some sort of justification because somebody was nasty. No, I don't think it's a. I don't think that's a good thing to do at all. Not at all. No. If, if you focus on them in daily life, when you have, when it's happening in daily life, they can get much stronger, and the whole emotion becomes much stronger. No, the the uh, the teaching is to substitute, 
as quickly as possible. Now, if the, the quicker we can substitute, the less harm is done. When the negative emotion has arisen, we're doing ourselves harm. The longer we keep it, the more harm we do ourselves. So the quicker we can get rid of it, the better we are off. Getting rid of it means that we do well. If we're very practiced, we can drop it. That's the best thing. It arises and you drop it. But that's difficult. That is a skill which needs to be learned. And uh, after a while it's, it's habitual. All skills become habitual. Anything that one has done for a long time, one doesn't even think it's a skill anymore. It's just something that one does. You know, like the things one earns one's living with. One just does it. But in the beginning, it's not easy to just drop. In the beginning, one has to find something else to put one's mind on. So if one cannot change the emotion into something uh, positive, like compassion or equanimity or something that is applicable at that moment and one has to take one's mind off the whole thing and go somewhere entirely different with the mind so that one doesn't do oneself more harm and then try again the next time to substitute but to focus on the sensation isn't going to be helpful can make could make it worse Yes. I was exposed to this idea of substitution about 10 years ago for the first time. And when I had that experience where something comes through with a song, which actually is a kind of a digesting of some kind of life experience, all these things come back in your memory, and all of a sudden you're in the middle of it, you don't even know how you got there, and you're mulling it over and mulling it over, and it seems to be no way out. So then I was exposed to this substitution idea. I tried that, like I said, about 10 years ago, I don't it's wrong, but for your patience, but I tried it and I found it really, I mean, I thought that it's impossible to do anything about it. It seemed to me as if I got myself further into it, because I was trying to substitute and just came back to the vengeance almost, that's the way it seemed. But now, here in this course, I realize I have now some perspective on it. I didn't track it all this time, but I realized that my substitution has become more effective or something, so I catch it earlier. I don't get myself lost in this welter of anger or whatever, you know, like, I mean, we really can get into that, before you actually realize what you're doing to yourself. So that I seem to, the skill that I've learned, like you say, to practice is the skill, the skill that I have learned now is to catch it earlier. And sometimes I'm lucky enough to catch it so early that it doesn't even turn into this mm. anger thing. Well, catching it early is mindfulness. That's what we're trying to learn, mindfulness. The more mindfulness one has, the quicker one catches everything. Mindfulness is one of the aspects of the meditative path. The more we meditate, the more mindful we become. The more we use mindfulness... I was going to talk about that. I have to wait till tomorrow. The more we use mindfulness the better off we are in our daily lives. You see, the, one of the things which could be used as a general statement, it will not always be appropriate, but it's a general enough to have a value, is that mostly we get angry at other people. We do get angry at ourselves too, but it's the most harm we do is when we get angry at others. And very often we get angry, or most of the time we get angry because they either say something or do something that we don't agree with. It's not the way we would do it, or say it, or like it, or have it. So when that is in us, that kind, and it can be quite furious, we can be quite uh, uh, overcome by that. It doesn't have to be just mild. The first thing to do at that time is to recognize the fact that that person has just as much dukkha as we have ourselves. And when we do that habitually, we're not, we don't have to get angry at anybody. Everybody has equal dukkha. has no difference. If you do that habitually for other people, compassion will be the natural result of that. 
It is so simple and so straightforward that one wonders why everybody isn't doing it. But most of the time the, the reason for that is we don't remember. This is what mindfulness will do, remembering, really remembering. Most of the time we don't remember a thing. All we know is what we want and what we don't want. We don't remember the teaching. So this is a very simple one and simple in its expression. It's not as simple to do, but it's simple in its expression. Everybody has equal dukkha. Nobody's exempt. It doesn't matter what it is. So there's no reason to be angry at anybody. They're just trying to do the best they can at all times. Sometimes the best they're trying to do is not the best that we think is the best. But that's our opinion, not their opinion. And that's all. It makes life so much easier. It really uh, reduces one's friction. And this is what most people suffer from. Friction. This is what the whole ego illusion suffers from. Friction. And that's the whole dukkha. I must remember to talk about mindfulness tomorrow. This sutta is too slow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else? Any other questions? Think of yourself as your own best friend. Caring, concerned, helpful and loving. Embrace yourself as your own best friend, the one you can rely on. The one who will help you to be happy. Think of yourself as the best friend of the person sitting nearest you in this room. Caring, concerned, helpful and loving. Wanting to give happiness to that person. And now think of yourself as the best friend of everyone here. Embrace everyone with your friendship, your care, your concern and your love, wishing to give happiness to each one.
think of yourself as the best friend of your parents. Caring, concerned and loving. Embrace your parents with your friendship, your love, wanting to bring them happiness. Think of yourself as the best friend of those who are nearest and dearest to you. A friend who will help, who is loving, who wants to give happiness. Embrace those that are nearest and dearest to you as their best friend, giving them your love and your friendship. Think of all your friends and be their best friend, the one who cares, the one who loves, the one who wants to give happiness without expecting the same in return. Fill all your friends with your love and your friendship. Think of all those people who form part of your daily life. Be their best friend. Feel them and embrace them with your friendship and your love, your care and concern, wishing to give them happiness.
think of all the people who are present in this place be their best friend loving and caring and helpful wishing happiness for them. (laughs) 